It's good to see you on this good morning. I'm glad that you could be out and we could be together and we could worship the Lord together. We're a week away from uh, starting our revival services, so I hope that you're continuing to pray each day for Wilson Green as he'll be coming to speak to us and minister with us, minister to us. I hope that you're praying about uh, your heart, that you're asking God to show you the pride in your heart, that you're asking him to take the pride out of your heart and to awaken the humility that is found in Jesus Christ and that God would enable you to abide with him. That God would enable you to walk with his Holy Spirit that we might experience the true presence of holy God. I want you to turn with me to the book of Malachi. We were in the third chapter last week. And this week we want to step back to the very beginning of the book and look at chapter 1. We're wanting to look at Malachi because he's dealing with a nation that's in some of the same troubles that we're in today. He's speaking to a nation about a hundred years after slavery. They had been in Babylon for 70 years. They were slaves there. About 50,000 of them had been released and they had been allowed to come back to Jerusalem. And there they settled and they began to rebuild the walls and they went through about an 80-year process of pulling all of that together and rebuilding the temple. They were fighting battles and they saw God work in miraculous ways, but they had built the building, and now they were satisfied with the building. It was not about worshiping God. It was not about loving the Lord. It was about God bless me and my house and my job and my bank account and make everything easy for me because we are your people, and so you ought to do all of these things for us. And so Malachi steps on the scene, and he begins to speak to them, and he begins by saying that he has a burden from the Lord. And if you start with me in chapter 1, in verse 1, I want you to hear the very heart of this prophet. He says, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. It's not easy to say what God wants us to say. They say that prophets uh, are stoned twice. They were generally stoned because nobody liked their message. And then a hundred years later, they would set a stone over their grave, and that generation would talk about how great the prophet Elijah was, or Elisha, or Malachi, or Obadiah, or whomever it was, Jesus spoke about that, how they chastised and killed the prophets, and then a hundred years later wanted to brag on that was our prophet. Malachi is standing on dangerous ground. He's got a group of people that are disgruntled. He's got people that are not spiritual. And people that are claiming that because they've got a temple that's been rebuilt, that they're going to claim the blessings that uh, Wendell read to us about this morning in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. They wanted that Shekinah glory of God to come down and let the world know that they were great. You see, their little country of Israel had not grown back to what it was when Solomon was king. They were not a rich, prosperous nation. They were not known the world over for their faith in God. They were not traveled to and attended and visited. Matter of fact, people had forgotten all about them. When I read this passage and I think of what Malachi was having to do, I think about the church today. They now call us living in a post-Christian, a postmodern society. They tell us that the grand days of the church are past. 
that if you missed them in the 70s and the 80s and 90s and 2000, if you missed the building of the mega church and the mega choirs and the other things that went along with it, that you've missed the gray end days of the church. And we're living in those post days when there's just buildings sitting around. They're, in Europe, they're making those buildings into gas stations and restaurants and houses because nobody attends church much anymore. And it's into a situation similar to that that Malachi steps up to the podium and says, God has given me a word, and I'm burdened by that word. I'm sure we would sit there and say, well, go ahead and kind of be up front with us, Malachi. Go ahead and tell us what it is. He says, this is what burdens me. Let's look at verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say in return... In what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Let's just stop there for a moment. These are verses that speak to the depth of our soul. God says that he loves us and we have the audacity to say, God, kind of show me how you love me because you haven't seen the troubles in my family, have you? You haven't seen the troubles in my finances or the troubles in my church, my church fights and feuds and changes deacons and pastors like I change clothes. God, you just haven't seen, have you? And God gives us a tremendous all-encompassing truth here. God looks us squarely in the face and he says, I love you. We could go to the book of John and read that off-quoted 316 verse where God says that he loved us so much that he gave us his son so that whosoever believes in him would not have to perish but that we could have everlasting life. And from that passage, we glean a little bit of understanding of what God means when he says that he loves us. Because love has two sides to it. It's like a sword with two edges. It cuts both ways, and we can't have one side without the other. When we speak of abiding in Christ and abiding in God, we read that famous passage, passage out of John 15 and we struggle with the mindset of abiding in God and he gives us the illustration of a branch N nobody talks a whole lot about branches they talk about the fruit but that old branch has to abide in Christ and we come to understand that abiding is agreeing with God about everything if I'm going to abide with God then I must agree with him about everything that he says and everything that he does. Otherwise, I'm going to be at a, at, at a place of stalling and saying, God, I can't go there. But if I'm going to abide with him, I'm going to have to say, God, I agree with what you're saying, and therefore I will obey you. The other side of that, though, is a word called sacrifice. And we get it right there from John 3, 16. God said, this is how much I love you. I sacrificed my son for you. Oh, now, we don't, we don't like that part of love, do we? That idea of sacrificing. And yet we see it throughout the scriptures. We see the great love event that unwraps for us in Genesis. When God is testing, and I want you to know that God will test your love for him. When God is testing Abraham's love, how much do you love me, Abraham? Oh, well, I've left my home for you. I've wandered around in tents just for you. I've walked where you wanted me to walk. I've listened to you talk. I'm 
Lord, I'm your man. God says, then I need you to make a sacrifice. Lord, I'm abiding in you. I'm agreeing with everything that you say. God says, then I need you to make a sacrifice, Abraham. And I need you to sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac, that I have promised to create nations through. And Abraham, and I don't understand how a father could do this, but Abraham raised his hand and said, Father, I abide in you, and I agree with everything you say. And he put the wood on Isaac's back, and they walked up the mountain. Abraham was abiding in God the Father. He was agreeing with everything that God had That's an amazing story. What an amazing faith that father had. What an amazing love Abraham had. That he was abiding in God so deeply that God could say, I want you to sacrifice your son. And he could say, Father, then I'll do that. And we get there and we see the event unfold. He's a young boy. He's strong. He's the one that's carried the wood, not Abraham. Abraham's the old man. He's just walked along with a knife on his belt and a little pot of fire. It's Isaac that's done all the work. I've often thought Isaac could have outran him. Isaac probably could have overpowered him. He was about 115 at that point. Surely he could have kicked the old man in the knee and took off or something. But we see another episode of love. We see a young son named Isaac who is abiding in his father's love and he agrees with everything that his father says. And he lays down. I think he willingly let Abraham tie his hands and tie his feet. And he willingly laid down on that altar because he loved his father and he agreed with everything that his father said. It's one thing to step back and say, my goodness, what kind of love and faith that is to agree with everything that God said. But the other side of the coin, to see the sacrifice that has to be made. I think this is where love kind of comes to a screeching halt. I think it's where it falls apart in our lives. We like people that agree with everything that we say, but we don't like making the sacrifice that's required of us in order for that love to blossom and bloom. God said, I've made the sacrifice. I've made the sacrifice. Jacob have I loved. And I chose to build a nation through him, but I did not choose to build one through Esau. The Edomites would come from him, and we'll see that in a minute. But he says, I've loved you. It's a deep subject, isn't it? You know, I have more problems with verse 2 than I do verse 3, that God would state that he loved Jacob. Do you know who Jacob was? He was a deceiver. He deceived his brother out of his birthright with a pot of stew. He deceived his brother out of his blessing from his father by putting goat hair on his arms and on his neck. He was a liar. He was a cheater. He spent 20 years with his father-in-law Laban, who was just as much of a rascal as Jacob was. And there he was cheated, and there he cheated Laban, and he wound up with four wives instead of one in a herd, and it had to be God who stepped in and told Laban, back off, because I have a purpose for Jacob. And Jacob stands there in the middle of a wilderness and says, God, I'm a low-down fellow. You could translate Jacob's name as tricky one. I don't know that I would want to be known as the God of the old tricky one. 
But then when I look in the mirror, I don't know that I would want to be known as the God of Greg Carroll either. That's an amazing statement that we run over so quickly that God loved Jacob. If there was ever a rascal that you did not want to do business with, Jacob was the guy because he was going to come out on top. He was going to make sure of that. And yet God said, I love him. I understand more about God hating Esau. Esau is the father of the Edomites. They're going to show up at Jesus' birth. His name is Herod. He's a descendant of, the, of Esau. He's going to try to kill Jesus. And he kills slaughters. Many t children, two years old and down. His ancestors are going to show up and be the ones who, that Paul is going to speak to. His name is Herod Agrippa. And these Herods are going to put Jesus to death on a cross and they're going to persecute the church and they're going to try to destroy everything that God is doing through Jacob. I understand completely God making the statement that I've hated Esau. Who would like him? They were some of the most brutal and violent people that there were. The Psalms even speak about God would be justified in dashing their children against the wall because that's what the Edomites were known for, destroying villages and taking the children and throwing them against walls and cutting the women open. That's how violent they were. I, I don't have any problem with God saying I hated Esau. And yet God said, I love you, oh tricky one, Jacob. God has reached down and chosen to pour out his love into people who did not deserve it. Jacob did not deserve it. Esau did not deserve it. We receive it today. I say all this because I want to dig to the depths of your heart this morning and I want you to grasp the understanding that I'm not sure what your life has been like. Maybe you way you thought it would. Maybe your job didn't turn out the way you thought it was. Maybe your life has just had so many downs you don't know that there's any ups in life. And you're saying, nobody loves me. I want to assure you this morning on the authority of God's word, God, the Father, loves you this morning. Amen. And love is not just sticky and funny feeling and me always getting what I want and me always being happy. No, there's an abiding side of love and there's a sacrifice side of love. And you're going to have to have both of them. God has demonstrated that for us. Well, let's talk about verse 3 for a moment. So if God has stated this all-encompassing truth for us that he loves us and God does not back up from his word, then let us deal with verse 3 because Esau I have hated. And then he tells us what he's done to Esau to the people who came afterwards. He said, I laid waste his mountains and his heritage. Esau married two wives right off the bat. One was not going to be sufficient, so he dove right in and married him too. That's a prideful man, isn't it? One woman's not enough for me. I need two at the very beginning. For the jackals of the wilderness, even from Edom, has said we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Can you see their pride? We don't need God. I don't need God to love me. I'm my own man. We're our own people. If our stuff gets destroyed, we'll just turn and we'll build back ourselves. This was a nation that said we don't need God. My goodness, that could be written over the doors of many nations today, couldn't it? We don't need your God. I 
I have never gotten it out of my mind when we were out in Nebraska a few years ago and I spoke to a Native American there about Jesus Christ. And he said, I don't need Jesus Christ. And I said, but uh, everybody that's lost needs a Savior. And he said, I'm not lost. He said, I was born a Native American. I'm automatically going to heaven. I don't need Jesus Christ. And I, it lingers in my heart because I see that attitude in people today. I don't need God. I don't need Jesus Christ. I'll build my own life from the very ground up. Verse 3, God is testing Esau. He's given him opportunity to humble and to repent, but he says, no, I'll do it my way. There was a couple of people who made that song famous, didn't they? When I die, they'll know that I did it my way. But it's a passage that is filled with doubt. They said, we don't need, we don't need a savior. We don't need a God. We don't need a temple. We don't need anything. When he uses the word hated, he is not speaking of it in a positive sense of saying, I, you know, I hate whatever food it is you don't like. I can't even think of any food that I hate right now. <laughs> but we're not using it in that fashion. He's using it as a comparison, and he does this throughout the Bible. Matter of fact, when you get to Romans chapter 9, Paul is actually using these very words when he speaks to Israel, and he's trying to get them to understand how much God loves them. That God sent the Savior through the Jewish people and God has kept his promise through the Jews and God will use them again. And, in the, you know, and God is not through with the Jews yet. He loves them. He cares for them. And he used it as a contrast that in comparison to his overwhelming love for Jacob, his reactions toward Esau would make it seem that he hated Esau. Because he did not choose Esau to be that nation of blessing. He did not choose Esau. And matter of fact, he did it before they were ever born. He told Esau's mother, Rebekah, he said, there's going to be two children born out of you. And the older shall serve the younger. And the younger is the one I've chosen to bring the blessing of the world through. We see it in Jacob's life, the old tricky one. He loved Rachel, didn't he? But he didn't love Leah the way he did. And it's, it was shown throughout. It wasn't that he, he hated her. I mean, my goodness, they had six children, seven children. I don't know how many him and Leah had. They just kept coming. So it wasn't like, you know, he couldn't stand the sight of her. But he just loved his first wife the best. That was the chosen one for him. God said, I've chosen Jacob and I've chosen Israel, and he tells us today, I've chosen you. He says, I've elected you. I've chosen to draw you out of the world and to pour my unspeakable love into your life. When Jesus spoke to his disciples about following him, he said, you will have to hate your father and your mother, meaning that you will have to love me more than you love mom and dad, or you won't be able to go with me. And he would later say, as he saw the crowds depart from him, he would look at the 12 that remained and would say, will you leave me also? And we see that when we get to the point of sacrifice, that sacrifice in the greatest love story there's ever been, we find that Jesus stands all alone. Because they did not hate father and mother they hated Jesus Christ, and they did not go to the cross with him. It's pride that we see in these Edomites. It's pride that we see in Esau, and God says, I hate pride. He hates pride in you and me. But the Esau had been eat up with it, and it carried into his children, and throughout his lineage, 
we see it over and over again and we see it grow and we see the sins of the father pass to the sons and the grandsons and the list goes on. Hatred is a cancer that eats inside us. And yet God would tell us, I still love you. I'm still sending my son to die for you. Jesus went to that cross and paid the price for our sins. Can you imagine that? Paid the price. And God said, I love you. I love you. But I hate your sin. It's a two-sided sword. He made the sacrifice. Jesus would look at his father and say, not my will, but your will be done. He was saying, Father, I agree with everything that you're doing. Well, you're going to have to go to the cross and die. I agree with that, Father. You're going to have to take the sin of the world upon you. I agree with that, Father. You're going to have to face death, and this body will have to die and lay in the grave. I agree with that, Father. And to agree with you, I'm willing to make the sacrifice because I love you and you love me. He would tell his disciples that me and the Father are one. We're totally in agreement in whatever my Father tells me to do that I do. This love thing sounds a little deeper than what we sing about in our songs, doesn't it? It sounds a little deeper than what we write on birthday cards and anniversary cards and Christmas cards. The love that we talk about is kind of fleshly. We kind of touch it. We kind of rub shoulders with it. We kind of share it back and forth. But this love that God is speaking about here seems so much deeper than that. It seems to be a love that cannot be interrupted. It is not put aside. Abraham is one of the few men in the Bible who demonstrated that abiding love and that sacrifice. Because of his great act of sacrifice and his abiding, agreeing with God, he is known as the friend of God. You know, God doesn't say that very often. This is my friend. He says he loves you, and we struggle with that love. But with Abraham, he could say, this is my friend. You know, we talk today about the broadness of relationships today because of electronics. We know people around the world. Isn't that amazing? We email and people that we've never physically met before in our lives. But can we call them friends? Can we call them somebody that would sacrifice for me. Abraham was that kind of guy with the father. Jesus was that kind of guy with the father. Jesus would look at his disciples and say, it's a hard thing to lay down your life, even for a friend. <laughs> Love's a very deep thing, and we have made it a shallow mud puddle of sorts. God comes along and says, I want you to know that I love you. And because I love you, I'm going to reach into your life and I'm not going to let you get away with sin. I'm not going to let you ruin your life with sin. I'm going to step into it. And these Israelites had just been in slavery for 70 years. My goodness. The whole time God was saying to them, you're here because of your sin. You're here because of your sin. You're here so that I can recollect you and bring you unto myself. And I'm going to turn you back loose and I'm going to give you a second chance. And they thought more of a temple, a building, than they did of God. And so Malachi is coming to them again. And he's saying, I've got a burden from the Lord. You love your temple, but you don't love me. Could that be said about you and I today in any way, in any form, in any fashion? I love the things, the possessions that God has given me more than I love God. 
If we were to turn these verses around, would we have to say, my possessions I love, but God I hate. You see the burden that Malachi was having to deliver? It was not an easy message. It would have been so much easier to say, let's all stand, clap our hands, jump up and down and shout and say, hallelujah. But that wasn't the message of God. God's heart is broken in this passage. You ever had a broken heart to speak to you? Maybe it was on the phone and they could hardly speak. But what they got out was, I love you. I love you. And maybe that was the end of the conversation. But let's pull these verses together. Because not only does God state a truth, I love you. And that truth is good today. Not only is God testing Jacob and testing Esau, but he's testing your love and my love today. Do we love God? And do we hate? Do we love less the things of this world? He says at the halfway point of verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts. That's the Lord, the captain of the Lord's army. This is a military term. This is fighting. Fighting words. Love is a fighting word. They may build, God says. Military terms. But I will throw it down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see, though, he's speaking to Israel, and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. You see, the Israelites were so selfish of God that they could not see that God had been protecting them. During the time that they rebuilt the walls with Ezra and Nehemiah, during the times of the battles that had come against them, it was God and God alone that had protected this little weak piece of a country there that had nobody, knew nobody, had no power. Sounds like us, doesn't it, as individuals? Sounds like the church today around the world, powerless. And God said, you're going to see what I do, and you're going to stand up and say, God is known beyond the four walls of this building. God said, I want to bless you. Your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord is exalted, magnified, glorified beyond the border of Israel, beyond our temple. It's about God, not about us, Israel. They were, it was trying to click in their minds. It's like you and I today. It's not about you and me. But it's about Jesus Christ. We look at revival and think that revival is all about me and it's all for me. No, it's all about Jesus Christ being Lord. Because if he is not Lord in your life, then I guarantee you there is no revival going on in your life. For revival to occur, we must become the servants and God the master. And Jesus will be Lord. That's when things will change. That's when we will agree with everything of, that God says. And we will be willing to sacrifice even our own lives for him. How do you think those, those martyrs like Stephen could stand there and say, Jesus is Lord, while they were throwing the stones? You see, they agreed with God about everything he was saying. And they were willing to be the sacrifice. Preacher, does love call on me to do that? It most certainly does. You just have some funny feelings in your stomach that you call love until you come to embrace the um, tremendous aspect of who God is. Love does not describe God. God describes love and his love is far deeper and greater than our minds are comprehending agreeing with God about everything and willing to 
be the sacrifice is necessary or to sacrifice what I've got to agree with God. I want you to understand this morning that God loves you. And the question for you is, do you agree with him? Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer.